Hey everyone and welcome to my guide to Apocalypse Now from the A-Level Film Studies Equidas course. Last week I did Vertigo and that was part of the Section A Component 1 which the other film for my particular course would be Apocalypse Now Component... well, same component. Essentially in this section it's down to like the teacher of the course which two films get picked so for us it's Vertigo and Apocalypse Now so this will be the comparison video to Vertigo. So for these two to be compared, it would probably be advised that you watch the Vertigo video before this one, just to understand a bit of context. If not, you can just watch this one as well. Either one's fine. So because it's the same section, um, both Apocalypse Now and Vertigo both specialise in auteur theory, which if you missed the last video where I explained it, auteur theory is essentially the theory that the director of the work is the creator and should be labelled as the author, since the name auteur, author, similar, yeah. So, Apocalypse Now was directed by the good old man Francis Coppola. Um, you may know him for creating works such as The Godfather. So, synopsis of the film. man named Willard, he's out of commission from the army for a bit and is sent back into Vietnam to um, hunt after a man by the name of Kurtz, who has went completely rogue and completely off the rails. They'd sent in some other people to go um, find him, figure him out, and kill on sight. However, they seem to have went completely silent. Just radio gone. Radio gone? Mm. So, Willard teams up with a group of four other people in the military, and they find their way around. So they meet up with a man called Kilgore, who is completely hungry for war, essentially obsessed with it. Um, they team up for a small amount of time to go and basically raid a village um, as part of the war tactics. So after teaming up with Kilgore, um, the team keeps sailing down the river and they continue to go. They stop at Playboy Bunny's um, place for a bit of a celebration and to restock. Keep going down the river. This entire film essentially takes place going down the river all the way to get to Kurtz's hideout. Towards the end of the film, two of the members, um, Clean and Chief, have died, leaving only Willard, Lance, and Chef. And they essentially get to Kurtz's place, and he's gone completely mad and insane, hanging out with the local tribes, and essentially has like adopted them, almost, it kind of seems like. So they get there, and it's just kind of creepy from there on. Willard nearly joins forces with Kurtz after being driven borderline insane and then kills him, and that's the end of the film. Which, from a synopsis standpoint, sounds really crap, to put bluntly. It just doesn't sound entertaining in the slightest bit. However, in the way that they execute it, through the like aesthetic of the film, and through the themes of the film, I think it's absolutely brilliant what they did. What they did? I think it's absolutely brilliant what they did. <laughs> so going into auteur theory, um, like I did in the last video, I went through Hitchcock's um, main auto signatures. This time I'll be going through Francis Coppola's auto signatures. So the first one being the glorification of violence, conflict, and war. And a particular way it was worded is he shows horrific situations presented in aesthetically beautiful ways, which in this film can be seen all throughout anything in Kurtz's hideout. Um, the one that comes to mind is the cow being completely slaughtered, which they used a real cow for that. That's horrific. But it's such an aesthetically pleasing shot. And it's just the same throughout the entire film. Any show of violence, or especially um, as Kilgore's fleet is flying over an innocent village and just bombing it to smithereens. It's dark, it's horrific, but it's really beautiful to watch. Oh, which sounds messed up. Another theme would be family and brotherhood, which links to Kurtz, the main antagonist. It also links to Willard and the gang. Um, he likes anti-heroes, so Willard is a very much an anti-hero. He has a lot of sort of dark parts about him, and the film tends to focus more on the journey rather than the character of Willard, obviously. Um, another one of his signatures is a critique of social structures and hierarchies, basically a critique of anything the government does. Playboy Bunny scene, fabulous example to it. I'll go more into depth when we get into the context. 
there's a heavier focus on aesthetic over narrative and dialogue, which is massive in this film. Everything in this film is strikingly beautiful in a weird sense, which is perhaps also down to Storaro, which I'll mention in a sec, um, and how the set is composed. Coppola really likes his aesthetic sets. Obviously, he has a massive focus on aesthetic over narrative and dialogue. And the last one of his more important signatures is Catholicism. You see, um, Coppola was raised in a Catholic household. However, he quite despised the church and therefore grew up kind of rebelling against the church, which sounds way darker and cooler than it was, but it's more just becoming an atheist, I guess. But despite this, Catholicism is still a very strong and prevalent theme in most of his films. And these particular ones, individual rituals, symbolism, and what's called the fall of man, or more commonly known as lapsarianism, which is, I think, really important for this film as you see Willard completely descend. Even in the first scene, it's an entire monologue just explaining how much he's descended into complete sort of mental collapse. Even getting into the curse section, he just covers himself with this crazy makeup and becomes really primal almost. But my favourite example of the fall of man has to be Lance, who at the start is a pretty normal person, but as the horrors of this war keep going on, he just gets more and more messed up and he sort of regresses into this childlike innocent state, which is really sad and dark to see, but also weirdly beautiful, linking back to obviously the aesthetic over narrative. And obviously, just like with Vertigo, we have the arguments against Coppola being an auteur. The main one, which appears in both films, is other key influences. And this one has a couple. First of all, we've got Martin Sheen, who is the main actor who plays... I nearly said Sky. It's not Sky. <laughs> that would be the geezer from the Vertigo. The main actor from Apocalypse Now is Willard. <laughs> So Martin Sheen plays Willard, um, and he could be considered a key influence due to his incredibly convincing performances with some moments completely being improvised, such as in the opening scene. Out of complete anger, he punches the mirror, which was a complete shock to anyone on set, and it is strikingly beautiful and incredible to see. But that improv kind of pushes the scene in more of his own direction, in a sense. However, this is very minor. Very, very minor influence, so I wouldn't even count him at all, to be honest. A more extreme example in this film would be Marlon Brando. Now, oh boy. Marlon Brando is an infamous method actor, and he plays, and he plays Kurtz in this film. If when you watch the film you thought the very end of the film theme seemed completely different to everything else seen throughout the film, that's down to Marlon Brando. Marlon. It's Marlon Brando, not Marlon. Marlon Brando, spelt like this. So he essentially played the roles of Kurtz, and on set he physically refused to learn any of his lines in order to, and I quote, embody the character, which in turn meant that Coppola spent nine days, nine entire days explaining his character to him, only for him to quote unquote become a completely different version of Kurtz, and just completely took it in his own direction. He's also an incredibly expensive actor, so if you combine those two facts, it seems like an almost scammy move. But Coppola really wanted him because of his acting talents um, when he'd worked with him before a few years prior on The Godfather. The main consensus that a lot of people get from Marlon Brando is that he has a giant craving for power. And he just took control of the entire script and brought a direction to fit what he wanted rather than the director which is the exact opposite of auteur theory. <laughs> so it could be argued that Coppola can't be an auteur because other actors, especially Marlon Brando, just did whatever they wanted. And the final key influence, which I think is important, is Storaro, who is the film's cinematographer and more commonly known as the God of Colour, which, by the way, is a title I crave. I love that title. That sounds so fucking cool. Storaro had an incredible, innovative, unique use of cinematographer, as he used a very special technique where he lit the set and not the actors, which would require the actors to walk into the light. If they walked out of the lights, they're not lit anymore. 
which makes for a very naturalistic and aesthetically beautiful and unique like look to the film. Which just look at any scene throughout. There is so much darkness, there is so much natural lighting, and it works. It just works. Another technique he uses is by using no fill light, which essentially keeps the light looking more natural and very dark. And it could be argued that because one of Coppola's auto signatures is aesthetic over narrative, that by Storaro creating this aesthetic, maybe it's not actually, you know, a good idea to give Coppola full credit of being the auteur when Storaro is the one creating the aesthetic. He's literally creating one of his signatures. So they're all very solid arguments and one that I'd definitely use, especially with Storaro and Brando. And another argument against is production hell, which is what I've put in my notes because it absolutely is. There was so many disasters, so many problems on set that Coppola just had basically no control the entire time and it brought everybody on set going completely mad. There's a quote from Coppola saying that this isn't a film about Vietnam, this is Vietnam because of how much of a war it was just to get this film produced. So it could be an argument that because of all of the problems I'm about to list that Coppola shouldn't be listed as an author because he didn't have full creative control. So let's actually delve into this context. We'll start with the production because we're already on that subject, might as well. It's kind of pointless switching over to something random. So the film was produced by the film company American Zoetrope, or as it was at the time, Omni Zoetrope, which was actually a film production started by Coppola himself from the profits he made from the Godfather trilogy. Or at this point, duology? Duology? Two films? So this essentially makes Apocalypse Now completely self-funded and gives him full creative control. There is no studio influence because he is the studio, which completely negates any problem that a film like Vertigo had, where studio influence and the Hayes Code would stop that. Another thing is that the Hayes Code is completely abolished at this point, and the studio system is kind of gone. We're out of the golden age of cinema. And at this time in the 70s, Coppola was part of a group known as the New Hollywood, who challenged conventional filmmaking. And this is a big group with some big people in this group contained the likes of Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen and George Lucas, along with another three or four other people. And essentially this is why this section can be split out into Old Hollywood and New Hollywood, with Old Hollywood being in this sort of studio system, golden age, classic, um, like classic Hollywood, how it was, and New Hollywood being this new era. So, into the actual production hell. Shooting this film had so many difficulties. First of all, we had Marlon, Br Marlon Brando's defiance, which came at the very end of the shoot, but at this point everybody had been worn out by everything else, that so they just kind of let it happen, which is to this day why the ending is so awful in my opinion, and it seems really rushed. Yeah, some may argue it's beautiful and some may like it, but personally, no, I can't say I do. And whether you like it or not, it's kind of easily noticeable that it's different. Another interesting one was that during the middle of the shooting, Martin Sheen had a complete heart attack and was found crawling up the road. He had a heart attack from the stress of all of like the shooting and how disastrous it was going. He was only in his 20s, which just really puts it into perspective. Um, the entire film was shot in the Philippines. Um, they couldn't shoot in American soil because America, kind of a bit salty for losing the Vietnam War, not gonna lie. So they had to shoot in the Philippines somewhere that looked pretty similar to Vietnam, which came with a ton of disastrous problems. Insanely hot. Everybody was constantly borderline dying of exhaustion and the weather was hell. It was literally hell. There would be thunderstorms, there would be like regular storms, rain all the time, make it impossible to shoot. And there was an entire instance where the entire set was completely destroyed and needed to be completely re rebuilt over the course of many months. It was that bad. But another thing about being shot in the, in the Philippines is scenes that included actual military equipment, such as scenes with helicopters, they had to get the actual military in to help shoot those scenes. 
So obviously the military would have to fly these helicopters themselves and sometimes in the middle of the shoot they just have to fly off because they were still in use and they were still part of the military and heavily needed. That would happen frequently and every time that they do this they had to switch out to a different pilot which means they'd have to re-practice and they was basically able to not get any practice and it just came a complete disaster and throughout this film the complete stress of getting it all done for a certain time period and in a certain budget made Coppola threaten to commit suicide several times because of it. This shoot was entirely completely hell and there's a really good documentary called The Heart of Darkness which is actually the name of the book that um, Apocalypse Now is based after but Heart of Darkness really goes into the complete shoot of the film and how disastrous it was because it was, it was completely hell. Slightly off topic but apologies for like this light behind me getting a bit darker throughout the video um, this is coming from my window and my natural lighting <laughs> which I picked the worst time to shoot this because it's getting darker and the same happened with the last video but I hoped it wouldn't be noticeable but long and behold it was so just apologies I guess anyway no one cares moving on so another bit of context that should be looked into is the context of the time and what was happening in the world so this film was created in 1979, which was a few years after the Vietnam War, which everybody knows as being a complete disaster for America, because they lost. And it was awful. <laughs> but throughout this time, many particular things changed in society. First of all, there was a lot of televised depictions of this war. Like, this was the first televised war, which in turn led a lot of people in the public to actually seeing the horrors of war and getting a sort of desensitization to violence which is obviously quite helpful for Coppola's glorification of violence or to signature. Because this was such a blunder for America um, this is something that Coppola wanted to actually delve into which is why this film is quite critical of the Americans role in it. It portrays it as it was such as a particular scene that shows this is when they um, go and investigate a ship and just shoot them all. They shoot everybody in the ship and just leave because they assume that they're going to hurt them. They don't. They just assume that. And they're just unnecessarily aggressive to absolutely everybody. Which just kind of... It's a very critical of America's role in the actual Vietnam War. Another key societal thing that was happening at this time, or slightly earlier but kind of delving into this time, is the sexual revolution and the rise of second wave feminism in America. So this was around the point where there was a lot of sort of sexual revolution from women no longer wanting to be tret the way they have been. As you could probably see in Vertigo that was made at a time where it was still quite a domesticated sexist society, a patriarchal society should I say, and at this point, a lot of women and like supporters of these women were standing up and basically saying, no, this isn't how it should be. Um, and this mostly revolves around the fight for the contraception pill um, and pornography. One of the key arguments that came out of this film was the argument of pornography. So the argument was split into two groups of anti-pornography and pro-sex which can be seen in being reflected in Apocalypse Now, um, particularly the Playboy Bunny scene. If you watch the re redux or redo of the film, where they basically re-edited it in a different cut and added some more scenes, there's a second Playboy Bunny scene which is equally as important. Essentially the ideas of pro-sex was that pornography should be allowed, women should be allowed to express sort of how they were, sex work should be, you know, shown off, but the ideas of anti-pornography is essentially that pornography should still be banned. And it could be argued that Coppola supports a more anti-pornography stance in this film. In the first Playboy Bunny scene, it's shown as the Playboy Bunnies are all sort of, you know, seductively dancing for all of the men. The men kind of go crazy and start becoming a lot more violent, almost. They jump over the fences, they, like, start being really 
gropey, um, grab onto the helicopter, try fly away. They basically become immature, primal idiots, to put it bluntly. And then, interestingly, in the second Playboy Bunny scene, the gang of five are Mystery Incorporated. Basically, they all get to trade some oil for some time with the Playboy Bunnies. And the scene's shot in an interesting way. Visually, you see that the guys are all interested in how the women look and only care about their bodies as they start to model them. But the women are talking about how they don't like that stuff and they don't like being completely objectified and sexualized for benefit of others and how it genuinely has a negative effect on them. But the guys just keep agreeing and they're just like, yeah, yeah, keep going and just start to be they're doing the exact same thing that they're talking about not liking. And the scene is set up quite comedically, but it is a quite decent message talking about the stance and potential impact that pornography may have on men, which is something that I believe the Coppola may be trying to imply. However, by having these scenes in there, it could be suggested that he had a very pro-sex approach, as he showed the Playboy bunnies and showed them being objects, quite literally conforming to what he was potentially fighting against. It's an argument to be had. Um, I personally believe he had a more anti-pornography approach than pro-sex. And I guess the final noteworthy part is the aesthetic of the film. So, as mentioned earlier with Storaro, um, the aesthetic of the film is very dark. There's a lot of chiaroscuro lighting, which is essentially using the darkness. And all the scenes are lit rather than the actual actors. This creates a very particular aesthetic of a lot of darkness and a lot of lighting on the scenes and sets rather than the actors, obviously. There's also a lot of symbolic imagery um, and a lot of rituals, as mentioned earlier. So all of the cuts ending scene is very ritualistic in its aesthetic. There's constant markings everywhere. There is tribal uniforms, there is actual rituals that take place, chantings, fire, which is very symbolic, and a sacrifice of an actual cow, which blew my mind, to be honest, because this entire final scene was shot in an actual tribe, and this was an actual ritual that took place, which is kind of, kind of cool, almost. And obviously, there is the Ride of the Valkyries scene, or is it Rise of the Valkyries? Ride of the Valkyries? There's the Valkyries scene. This entire massacre is aesthetically pleasing to watch because of the music, the cool cameras, use of explosions, um, the colour contrast, things like that. There's also a lot of good imagery in this scene, such as the helicopters flying out of the sun, reflecting the typical ending where the hero will rise off into the sunset. This is hero coming back from the sunset for more violence at their own free will and this dark scene is obviously represented as a very aesthetically pleasing through its camera work through its editing sound design coloring all of this so anyway this has been my complete guide to understanding apocalypse now from the equidas a level film studies course um still a long video sorry <laughs> I really like Apocalypse Now. It's possibly one of my favourite films that I study, so I'm ex I was excited to talk about it. And just in my notes, I filled out an entire page just talking about auteur theory for Coppola, so it's an interesting read. Disclaimer, obviously, do your own revision, do your own research, not everything might be accurate, but just take it as it is, yada yada, anyway. So, thank you for watching. Um, next week should be Winter's Bone, which I'm not looking forward to, to be honest. <laughs> but if all goes well, it should be Winter's Bone. Um, one of my favourite films. So I'm going from one of my favourites to my least favourite. Anyway, thank you for watching. Um, enjoy your day. Good luck with your revision. And... Adios, comrade. What? Oh, and again, say hi to Fido.